A language's grammar is its backbone. It can range from virtually non-existent to vast and complex. In my last video about the basics of language creation, I briefly covered grammar, creating a basic word order, nominative and accusative cases, and a definite suffix. If you don't know what that means, you probably ought to watch the first video. From here, there are dozens of different things we need to be able to say that we need to come up with different strategies for. So first things first, plurals. For the sake of this particular set of videos, I'm going to make a point to avoid overly Englishy features. I'm not going to make it the complete antithesis of English, but if you're watching this video, I think it's pretty fair to say you already understand English grammar. So plurals, right? The difference between cat and cats. In English, all nouns have plurality. They're either singular, plural, or a mass noun, and that is something considered to be uncountable by the language. So you can have, for example, one, two, or three apples, but not one, two, or three water. Instead for water you need additional constructions making the quantity clear, like one, two, or three buckets of water. The first important thing to remember about plurality is that marking it on nouns isn't remotely necessary. Some languages just don't say anything about plurality unless it's made explicit. And whilst this sounds weird, it is helpful at times. When I was making my dragons in battle video, I had a decent amount of trouble talking about the dragons on a side, because it was ambiguous how many dragons there were, so I kept wanting to say dragon or dragons, which just sounds far too overcomplicated. So in this language, we can have the number left entirely unmarked, and when you want to specify, there are suffixes. So singular and plural are the most basic ones, but there can be plenty more. First, there are specific numbers for things. Dual numbers, for two of a thing, aren't too uncommon, and whilst no documented language has a trial form on all of its nouns, there are plenty with trial pronouns. Uh, and even some improperly attested languages are thought maybe to have quadral numbers for pronouns. There are also collective plurals for collections and palcal forms, which basically just means a few of things. So we'll have a singular, palcal, and plural affix, but where do they go? Most agglutinative languages have a fixed order of affixes in a set of morphological slots. And right now we have the root, followed by a slot for the definite, then a slot for the case, which is normally at the end. So let's just slide plurality on in here. So now the dogs becomes Juanafein. Next, one common feature of nouns is some kind of gender. Now, if you haven't already gone around the circuit of linguistics videos, you might not know that just because grammatical gender is called gender doesn't mean it actually has anything to do with gender, because linguists are just the best at naming things. Uh, but in all seriousness, while masculine-feminine and masculine-feminine-neuter are common divisions of grammatical gender, they can be split up in all sorts of different ways, like animate-inanimate, rational-irrational, or even common-neuter, where a masculine-feminine-neuter system used to exist, but the genders have merged, so now it's basically just gendered-non-gendered. I should also bring up the term noun class here. Its exact meaning is somewhat debatable, but in general, if a gender system has only a few genders, like say, two to four, it's usually called a gender system. But if it's got more, like say, how Swahili handles things, it'll be called a noun class system. But like I said, some people will use the terms entirely interchangeably, because again, aren't linguists just the best at linguistics? Anyway, I'm just going to rip off Sumerian and have a nice human-non-human -human gender system, which I'm going to call sentient-insentient on the off chance there's an alien invasion on the next episode of 2020. I for one welcome our new alien overlords. Uh, but given most con worlds usually contain some kind of non-human sentience out there, it does make sense. So it's time for another suffix, right? No. At the risk of triggering flashbacks for any ex-French students out there, I'm not going to mark sentience on the noun. So what exactly does gender actually do then? Well, for that, we'll have to move over to verbs. Verb agreement is a phenomenon where the verb has morphology which agrees with the subject, object, or both in some way. Consider in English the difference between run and runs. It is a form of verb agreement, although a fairly basic one. We'll make it so when a sentient being is the subject, the verb is left unmarked, but when an insentient being is the subject, it results in marking, since that's rarer. Uh, but to give a nice, broad view of how these kinds of things could work, we're just going to entirely reanalyze our agent tracking, that is, who is the subject and who is the object. Currently there's word order, grammatical case, and a basic verb agreement, all indicating who's doing what to whom, which is a bit much. What could happen is the verb agreement marker becoming a sort of inverse marker for when the word order is not what you'd expect, and the case being dropped, with the word order becoming sentient insentient and otherwise VSO. Hence in the phrase I love you, Hyan ni tri, word order determines that I'm the one loving you, and Hyan tri ni is you love me. But instead, if I'm loving a dog, it's determined by the inverse marker, so Hyan ni kwanen is I love the dog, and Hyanoch ni kwanen is the dog loves me. 
without the word order changing. And of course, for two dogs, roles would be determined by the word order again. So what we're building here is basically an animacy hierarchy determining the word order, currently in a basic form of sentient non-sentient, but we could add pronouns and names to the hierarchy. We are missing a few pronouns though, so um, there. We've gotten rid of the nominative accusative distinction too, then let's add all the pronouns to the hierarchy. So going back to I love you, the inverse marker now determines who loves who. Hyan nitri is I love you and Hyanoch nitri is you love me. And that's gender out of the way. Before we move on though, I should probably come back to cases. Now I did just annihilate the nominative and accusative case marking distinction, but we're going to add some different ones. Cases basically designate the role of something in a phrase, and there can be more than just the nominative and accusative. Consider the phrase, I gave you John's hat. This can be split up into five pieces. I is the subject, and as such is in the nominative case. Give is the verb, and so in no case. And hat is in the accusative, since it's a thing I'm given. You, however, is in the dative case, because you're the beneficiary or recipient of the action. Likewise, John is in the genitive case, indicating the relationship between John and his hat, which basically just makes it an adjective, where you could interpret something in the dative, nominative, or accusative as a sort of adverb, modifying what the verb means directly. Cases themselves can generally be put into this hierarchy, where if you have lower things, you probably also have the ones above, although this isn't a hard rule. Just look at Irish, which has a common case covering both the nominative and accusative, but various other cases too. A bit like what I'm gonna do. So we'll call unmarked nominative and accusative common, and then add a dative and genitive. Plus, I quite like a locative and instrumental, so we'll take them too. Okay, now we have a somewhat complicated system of nouns in place, uh, we can move on to the verbs. There's an awful lot that can go on with verbs, so we're going to try and keep things somewhat simple. Tense aspect mood, or tense aspect mood evidentiality, is a group of grammatical categories which are often bunched together, because in many languages they're kind of difficult to untangle. Uh, we are going to untangle them though. Uh, so tense is pretty easy to understand, basically just a marker for when something happens relative to now. In English we have a marked past form, generally with the ud suffix, and a basic form of a verb is considered to be in the present future since you use the word run both in the present and the future, although in the future you use the additional particle will to make it will run. And these can be further split up in some languages, uh, which distinguish between multiple pasts and multiple futures at times. Aspect expresses how a verb extends over time, like the distinction between I ran and I was running. Also note that in English you can't use both the past tense and imperfective morphology at once. So you can have run, ran, and running, but not ranning. Instead you have to use the particle was. So I was running. We're not doing this, but it's certainly worth mentioning it can be done. In any case, there are lots of aspects other than just perfective and imperfective. First I should bring up the perfect, which, thanks to another one of those, linguists just being the best at naming things, has basically nothing to do with the perfective. The perfect is a sort of mixture of tense and aspect, where you say you have done something. Another interesting one is the discontinuous perfect, which is like the perfect, but for when the thing you did is no longer the case. For example, if I have put it on the table but it's no longer there. There's also the habitual, which does exist in English to an extent. For example, if I say I run, it would generally be taken to mean I run habitually instead of I run now. And there are also additional ways of marking it in certain dialects of English, like with the word be in AAVE. Mood is the use of inflection to indicate a speaker's attitude to what they're talking about. The most basic mood is the indicative for stating things you consider to be the truth, like saying I'm hungry or John ate the apple. The subjunctive mood is used to express various different things which are not currently the case, like wishes, emotions, possibilities, judgments, opinions, obligations, or future actions. And the broadness of the category means additional particles are usually needed to specify what you mean. There are also lots of moods that overlap with this, like the optative mood, which expresses hopes, wishes, or commands. And there are plenty more, like the conditional mood for if statements, imperative for direct requests and commands, interrogative mood for questions, hypothetical mood for hypotheticals. But while there are lots of different types of mood, it is common just to have an indicative, subjunctive, and imperative. Finally, evidentiality is an inbuilt indication of how you know what you're saying. Some of these come in basic two-way distinctions, like things you've witnessed versus things you haven't, or things you've been told versus everything else. And then you have far larger systems, like FASU, with visual sensory, non-visual sensory, inferential, reported, heard from a known source, and direct participation, all marked differently. 
So to build out a system using these, first we'll look at tense and aspect and how they can be analysed. So let's say we have present, past and future tenses with perfective, imperfective and habitual aspects. First we need to work out how these will interact. Obviously we could just make them interact entirely as you'd expect, but a population of speakers are likely to start reanalyzing certain combinations. For example, in English, present perfect can indicate habitual. Since we have a separate habitual here though, maybe the present perfective could be a gnomic for things that are just generally true, like birds fly. You may note that English also notes this in the present perfective, and this is because of the lack of an article, a or the, before birds. So birds fly is gnomic, but a bird flies and the bird flies are not gnomic. But as it is, we have no distinction between a bird flies and bird flies, so we can't do that here. We could also start analysing the future habitual as a sort of optative mood for things you wish to be true, since saying I will be X in the future generally refers to a way you want to be. And I think you can already tell why tense aspects and mood can often be hard to untangle. So let's add some separate marked moods, an indicative, subjunctive and imperative. Now a lot of these probably won't be used. The imperative, for example, is rarely used for the non-present, so we'll scrap that. Likewise, the imperative imperfective is a bit redundant, but then again the imperative perfective could be used as a sort of stressed gnomic, with the imperfective present tense just becoming the default present tense. So let's just fill out the rest as you'd expect and move on to the affixes. Obviously not all of this needs to be affixed, but we're going to anyway. So far we've only used suffixes, and just to break that trend I'll have the mood marker be a prefix, although languages tend to have a default position for affixes without too much variation, and this language clearly favours suffixing. Then tenses and aspects. Uh, note here I've split up the location of the imperfective and habitual markers, which happens often enough in languages with a whole bunch of different slots, because different markers will be derived from different places, even if they mark for the same kind of thing. Uh, for the sake of simplicity though, we're going to say only one can be used at once. We're also just not going to mark evidentiality. And finally, I wish to see you with my dog becomes Ma som ni ro quan sal si niom. Albeit I skipped over a lot of the extra word order stuff. Anyway, before wrapping up this video, I should bring up the copula. There's a lot of fancy language I could use to describe the copula, but long story short, it refers to the word be and all its different tense and number forms like are, is, was, were, you get the idea. The copula is used in lots of different ways across different languages, but in highly synthetic languages, that is ones that contain lots of morphemes, and um, a morpheme is basically just an individual bit of meaning. So the word eat has one morpheme, edible has two morphemes, and inedible has three. Uh, synthetic languages, like say the one we've made here, uh, often attach the copula to nouns with affixes. So let's just say you can inflect a noun like a verb to make it one. So you or the dog becomes Thank you for watching. If you want to see more, I do have other related videos, and there's also the subscribe button. That's a nice one. Uh, anyway, thank you again, and good night.